All right, everybody. Um, welcome, welcome to the first talk in the 2020 to 2021 PMB seminar series. Um, uh, John informs me that we've been advised by campus to start Zoom meetings on Berkeley time. So that's why we're here at uh, about 1210 starting our talks. Um, so you can expect that for the rest of the seminar series. Um, and our speaker today that we're really excited to have is Ceci Martinez Gomez. Um, Ceci did her undergraduate work uh, at the National University of Mexico in biological and pharmaceutical chemistry. And she then went to Diana Downs's lab at the University of Wisconsin-Madison to study microbiology and to apply her training in chemistry to the enzymology of thiamine biosynthesis in salmonella. Following that, uh, Ceci went for a postdoctoral fellowship in Mary Lidstrom's lab at the University of Washington. And that's where she began the work that she's gonna sort of keep talking about and keep telling us about today. So the study of methylotrophy and the roles of lanthanides in the enzymes that are responsible for this metabolism. Um, Ceci started her own lab at Michigan State University in 2015, and she received an NSF Career Award to support her work on uh, rare earth elements in biochemistry. And we were fortunate enough to be able to lure her away to Berkeley uh, to plant microbial biology, uh, where she just arrived and joined our department in July of 2020. So we are very excited to hear, uh, to have you open up our series for this, for this term and um, welcome Ceci. Thank you so much for this invitation. I want to thank the department for inviting me uh, to have the opportunity to share with you what I think is a very exciting field of study. Uh, and hopefully by the end of my talk, you are as inspired as we are uh, to understand this emergent field and you will see that we have uh, still a lot of questions that we need to answer, but that we're super excited about uh, being able to tackle these um, aspects of what it is known as lanthanide biochemistry. So I would like first to start by introducing our model of a study. So we use a bacteria that is known as methylorobrum extorquense M1, previously known as methylobacterium, and I'll refer about the system as AM1 now on. AM1 is a methylotroph, which means that they have the capacity to utilize reduced carbon compounds as a sole source of carbon and energy. And so usually compounds that fit the description are compounds that do not have a carbon-carbon bond synthesis structure, and they're usually one carbon compounds. What I'm showing here in this picture is a, a streak of AM1, and as you can see, it's a pink bacteria. It's an alpha protobacterium that has been the model of a study for many decades. It is considered a facultative microbe because it can grow on these carbon sources, but it can also grow on multi-carbon sources such as succinate or ethanol. Uh, as a general note, I want to emphasize that methylotrophs in general are considered widespread in nature, and one of the ecosystems when they're fairly predominant and that I will keep mentioning during my talk is that they often live in the surface of the leaves of the plants, so in the phylosphere, and this is because pectin esterases are going to break pectin when either the leaves are growing or where there is exchange of gases, and therefore methanol is readily available. The other thing that I want to do in order to make my talk more clear is to introduce methanol oxidation. Uh, today I'm gonna to be focusing on methanol oxidation as the pathway that we're starting. And therefore, I would like to just mention some very brief details. So methanol oxidation in AM1 occurs or starts in the periplasm, where methanol is going to be oxidized to formaldehyde. And for many years, we thought that the methanol dehydrogenase MXAFI was the one, the enzyme catalyzing this reaction. MXAFI is a periplasmic enzyme that is known to be a heterotetramer. And what I'm showing here is a zoom of the active site. What you can see is that this uh, enzyme is using PQQ and also calcium as cofactors. And what we know about the mechanism in how this occur is that there's going to be a catalytic aspartic acid that is going to trigger the reaction and the oxidation of methanol. And PQQ is really going to be transferring electrons for this oxidation to occur. While the metal, in this case calcium, really serves as a Lewis acid, polarizing charges so PQQ is more readily available for this reaction. So once formaldehyde is formed, it's going to be incorporated into the cell 
And there's going to be a series of reactions that use a very sophisticated carbon carrier known as tetrahydromethanoderine that are gonna catalyze the conversion from formaldehyde to formate. And from there, there's going to be a split of carbon. Uh, part of it is gonna go or driven to assimilation. And another one, another part of the carbon is going to be further oxidized to carbon dioxide for energy production. So that's what we thought methylotrophy was about. But around 2011 to 2014, a group in the Netherlands were trying to isolate methylotropes from extremophilic conditions, in this case, volcanic mud pot. And what they discover is that in order to be able to isolate these strains, they have to add to the medium lanthanides, specifically serine. Uh, the first one that they describe is a uh, name here, and I'm gonna refer to it as Sol V now on. And what was very interesting about this microbe is that when they isolated and then sequenced its genome, Solvi didn't have the typical markers of methylotrophy. So it didn't have an MXAF gene, and it didn't have all the genes that are necessary for the tetrahydromethanoterine pathway oxidation. What it did have was a gene that we knew encode something that is like a methanol dehydrogenase, and that is known as SOXF. So what they decided to do was to purify this protein and they crystallize it. And what I'm showing here is again a sum of the active site where you can see that very similar to MXAFI, it contains PQQ, but instead of coordinating with calcium, this time it coordinates with serum. So this was very exciting. This was the very first time that it was shown that a lanthanide can be used as a cofactor in a bacteria. And also it allowed uh, this group to explain that when we look at the chemical properties of lanthanides, lanthanides are very potent Lewis acid, particularly if we compare it with calcium. So maybe the reason why a tetrahydromethanoterine pathway was not present is because SOXF with this very strong Lewis acid would have the capacity to not only oxidize methanol to formaldehyde, but also catalyze the oxidation from formaldehyde to formaldehyde. This was very exciting because they really show that lanthanide can be essential for certain methylotropes, and lanthanides belong to what is known as new life metals. What I'm showing here is a periodic table that is emphasizing what are metals that are important for biology or for life. And in black is the representation of the metals that we know are essential for life. In gray, that are important for many organisms. And what we're proposing is to include lanthanide to this periodic table. Now, uh, for this biological periodic table. So the question though is how widespread is lanthanide utilization in bacterial metabolism? So how widespread lanthanide biochemistry is? Is this something that is only involving methylotrophy or could, it be, could this be important for many other uh, environmental strains? If we look at the phylogenetic data of alcohol dehydrogenase, what it is very striking and obvious is that in reality, SOXF is actually widespread in nature and is also highly divergent. So we see that there are at least five different clades of different types of SOXF. While MXAF, you can see that is uh, not really as abundant. So we wanted to set up an experiment where we can visually uh, exemplify the impact of lanthanides uh, in methylotropes. And what we did was to collect different leaves outside of different campuses, and we printed those leaves on a plate that have our methanol media, as we use it until 2015, and then our media where we added lanthanum. And what you can see is that these prints uh, have striking differences. Not only were we able to isolate a, more, a lot more methylotrons, but we also saw many phenotypic differences. If we look at pigmentation and sometimes also some um, uh, other type of, of changes in metabolism, such as uh, biofilm formation, although that we saw that in liquid. So this really allows us to get very excited about this field and to try to understand how would lanthanide impact methylotropes in general. So as I mentioned before, we work with AM1, and AM1 has MXAFI, the calcium-dependent methanol dehydrogenase, but it also has two copies of SOXF. So the question that we wanted to ask is, if we add to the media lanthanide, what would happen with a microorganism that has the capacity to use both systems? And what I'm gonna show you is uh, the results of these studies. So this is transcriptomic analysis, and what we saw is what we compared was the growth with and without lanthanide. And with lanthanide, what we see is that the genes that are encoding the SOXF systems are upregulated. 
while those encoding the MXA system are downregulated. Now, this effect is known as a lanthanide switch. And unfortunately, today I don't have time to explain details of this transcriptional regulation. But what it is important to know is that even when AM1 has the capacity to have different alcohol dehydrogenase systems, in the presence of lanthanides, they really depend on the activity of SOXF1. So the other question that we wanted to ask is what are the different lanthanides that allow for AM1 to grow? So if we go into the series, we can divide lanthanides in light lanthanides, which is lanthanum to samarium, and then heavy lanthanides, which are europium all the way to lutetium. And what we find out is that for AM1, only the light lanthanides uh, allow growth of the strain. And in fact, as we go over the series, we see that there is a growth phenotype, as you can see here in this uh, growth curve. So we wanted to know why do we see this growth defect? So we decided to purify and characterize uh, success from AM1 when we grew the bacteria on methanol and lanthanum. And what we saw is that indeed, if we purify success, it's going to be coordinated with lanthanum in a one-to-one -one ratio, mole, per, mole of metal, mole polymer of success. And when we define some of the kinetic parameters, we see that this enzyme is actually very efficient as a methanol dehydrogenase. So the question was, if SOXF is very efficient and it is using lanthanide as a Lewis acid, could this resemble what we see with SOLV? Can SOXF not only catalyze the conversion from methanol to formaldehyde, but also from formaldehyde to formate? And so first we tested this in vitro, and what we saw is that SOXF is actually very efficient at using formaldehyde as a substrate. So we wanted to see if this correlate with what we see in vivo. In order to do that, we took advantage of our capacity to disrupt numerous genes in, the, uh, in our model of a study. So we know that under calcium conditions, the tetrahydromethanoterium pathway is important for the conversion of formaldehyde to formin. So if we disrupt this gene, what is going to happen is that formaldehyde is going to accumulate, it will be toxic, it will not allow the cell to grow, and it will also block carbon distribution to assimilation. So can this pathway be dispensable in the presence of lanthanides? And so what I'm showing here is a growth curve when we're growing wild type with methanol and lanthanide, and then how this FAE mutant strength uh, is going. And what you can see is that there is no growth. So there is discrepancy between the in vitro and the in vivo data, but we have even more compelling data that has shown that at least for AM1, SOXF is only able to catalyze the conversion of methanol to formaldehyde. Another thing that we were very interested in was to define different kinetic properties when different lanthanides are coordinated uh, with this protein. So we decided to grow our culture in the presence of different lanthanides. So we went ahead and tried neodymium, and we also purified the enzyme, and we tested the catalytic activity. And what we saw is that when SOXF is coordinated to neodymium, it's a very efficient methanol dehydrogenase. However, the occupancy of the neodymium is half of what we see from lanthanum. And then we tested this also with samarium, and we saw that there was less than 1% occupancy, and we were unable to detect activity. So this may explain why we see this growth defect as we go on the lanthanide series. And it really allows us to start asking questions about a structural uh, features of success that are necessary for lanthanide coordination. So what we decided to do was then to obtain a crystal structure of success. And what I'm showing here is the results of those studies. What I want you to focus is in the zoom of the active site. As it was described with SOLV, success from AM1 is also coordinating PQQ, and it is coordinating, in this case, lanthanum. And here in pink, you're going to see this aspartate, and then you're going to see right here another aspartate. This D318 is the catalytic aspartate. However, we see again and again that this additional aspartate is necessary for coordination with the metal. When we look at a comparison between the aptic side of MXAF versus SOXF, what we see is that this aspartate is present all the time in SOXF uh, proteins, but instead we see alanine in MXAF uh, proteins. So what we decided to do was some site mutagenesis and generate a variant where we will exchange this aspartate for an alanine. 
and see what, what would happen when we purify the protein if we grew the bacteria in the presence of lanthanides or the absence of, of lanthanides. And so what we saw is that when we purify SOCCEF, wild type SOCCEF, we see that there is coordination with lanthanide if we grow the strain on lanthanide, and we see decent activity. However, the variant that now, instead of that aspartate has alanine, is unable to coordinate with lanthanide, and instead can coordinate with calcium. However, when we try to detect activity of this um, variant, we cannot detect any methanol dehydrogenase activity. If we now grow the strain under calcium conditions, what we see is that SOCCEF wild type is able to coordinate with calcium, but we can barely detect activity. If we test the variant uh, where alanine is instead of aspartate, we see that there's really no coordination of metal and we cannot detect activity. So uh, what this is really telling us is that the way lanthanides are being incorporated into SOCCEF is more complicated than just changing one amino acid. But we can definitively say that this aspartate is essential for coordination of the lanthanide. We wanted to also correlate this data in vivo. And so what we did is we generated a mutant that will disrupt the SOCCEF system on the string. So this is growth of methanol and lanthanide. And here what I'm depicting is wild type carrying an empty plasmid. And I have to say that this plasmid does not contain the same promoters that are susceptible to the lanthanide switch. So we have constitutive expression of these uh, proteins. So when we disrupt SOCCEF1 and SOCCEF2, and we have an empty plasmid, is depicted here in green. So we see slight growth of this strain, and I'll come back to this observation. Now, if this double mutant is carrying a plasmid that is able to overproduce SOCCEF wild type, then we see that now the strain is able to grow. It's not growing as well as wild type due to the differences of the promoter, but it's still growing. When we instead have this double mutant overproducing the variant that no longer has this aspartate and instead has alanine, we see again this very slow and inefficient growth. So that was very exciting because at least in vitro and in vivo, we see a correlation of how this aspartate is very important for growth. So now we are very interested in having a high throughput approach. So we want to understand how different amino acids can allow the coordination with different metals and how does that influence activity. And for that, we have designed a site saturation library. And we have a very nice screen with our different mut mutants where we can really start assessing the uh, correlation of the change in amino acid and the capacity for them to bind with different lanthanides and also correlated with the catalytic efficiency. And this project is ready to be taken by a graduate student that hopefully is excited about understanding this type of structural changes. So now I wanna go back to this generation of mutants where we're disrupting the alcohol dehydrogenase systems. And we see again and again that when we disrupt SOCCEF1 and SOCCEF2, we still see a slow growth. So what we decided to do is to generate a triple mutant. So disrupt also MXAF. So under this condition, to what we knew then, we were disrupting all the alcohol dehydrogenase systems that we knew AM1 was able to use under lanthanide conditions. So what I'm showing here is again, a growth curve of methanol with lanthanide, and this is wild type growth. When we tested that triple mutant, what we saw again is this a slow growth that eventually if we leave it long enough, can reach full OD. So that really allows us to suggest that there was an additional alcohol dehydrogenase system that was able to use lanthanum and methanol. And so looking into our transcriptomic analysis and looking at the genome sequence, we saw that exa, a, a gene annotated as exa A, so an ethanol dehydrogenase, um, was slightly upregulated in our transcriptomics. So we decided to disrupt that system as well and tested growth. And sure enough, now we see no growth of this string. So I was very excited. We tested if these phenotypes also correlate with ethanol as this enzyme X, that, were, uh, that was annotated as XA and we renamed XAF uh, was predicted to use ethanol. And again, we tested a wild type mutant 
the triple mutant and then a quadruple mutant disrupting as XIF. And it's only when we disrupt XIF that we no longer see growth. So it was very exciting. We went ahead and purified XIF and determined, sure enough, that it also had PQQ as a cofactor, that it was able to coordinate lanthanides and that it was highly active. Here are some examples of the catalytic efficiency of methanol, of XIF. So using methanol, XIF is not a very efficient methanol dehydrogenase. However, when we provided ethanol as a substrate, we saw that the activity was really, really efficient. In fact, XIF is the enzyme that has been described as the most efficient ethanol dehydrogenase yet. And closest homologs are uh, present in strains such as Pseudomonas. And so then we predicted that maybe it was important to test lanthanide growth with microorganisms such as Pseudomona, and we are very glad to know that a group has followed up on this and has shown lanthanide effect on Pseudomona strains. So we also saw that XIF uh, was a good formaldehyde dehydrogenase. And again, unfortunately today, I don't have the time to talk about how we find out that an alternative activity for XIF has to do with formaldehyde homeostasis. But what it is very interesting is that we were able to show with XIF that really lanthanide metabolism is not unique to one carbon compounds, but it can expand to multi-carbon substrates. So following the same um, analysis, we have two different candidates, two different enzymes that we are eager to characterize because we know based on transcriptomics and initial activity assays that formate dehydrogenase and a zinc alcohol dehydrogenase are influenced by lanthanide. So this is a yet another project that we have funded that is waiting to be taken by a graduate student and we are eager for a graduate student to take on this project. Okay, so now we have talked about two different aspects that my lab is interested. What enzymes use lanthanide and how do lanthanides affect metabolism? And I would like to spend a lot more uh, time on this, but today I won't be able to do this. And instead, I wanna focus on a third aspect that my lab have been exploring. And that is, how is the bacteria, how is AM1 able to sense and acquire these lanthanides? And so for these studies, we partner with Betsy Scovran at San Jose State University. She teaches at Genetic Labs, and there they do a lot, uh, well, part of their lab, um, uh, program includes to do mutant hunts, so a genetic screen. And what we did was to take advantage of SOCCEF activity and produce formaldehyde. So we know that formaldehyde is going to be toxic and would not allow the cell to grow if we disrupt pathway of flux to assimilation. If we have a transposon mutagenesis, then we will be able to have a positive screen and be able to really uh, locate important genes that are uh, necessary for SOCCEF function and therefore lanthanide metabolism. And what I'm showing here is a table that uh, summarizes where these transposons were. So we obviously had hits that were expected, so the SOX operon, right, and also PQQ biosynthesis. But what was very striking is that we were also able to find uh, transcriptional regulators and genes of unknown functions that we're currently characterizing and trying to understand how do they contribute with this type of um, lanthanide dependent or SOCCEF dependent methanol oxidation. Something that was also very intriguing is that we find a cluster of genes that were encoding TOMB dependent receptors and ABC transporter. And we were very excited because we thought that we had been able to identify what we call the lanthanide utilization and transport cluster. And this is why we renamed these genes LOT for lanthanide utilization and transport. And what I'm showing here is how this cluster looks. In color are where we find hits uh, based on our transposon mutagenesis, and in gray are where we didn't find any transposon hits. If we look at modeling of this cluster, uh, you can see that LOT H is predicted to be a Tom B receptor. And in purple is what it is predicted to be the ABC transporter, both the membrane components, but also the periplasmic uh, LOT A enzyme. And now I'm going to show you a combination of phenotypic studies with microscopy studies. The idea or the goal was to see what is the effect of disrupting each one of these genes in terms of growth, but also on the localization of the lanthanide. And so what I'm showing here is how, oh, and I do want to remark 
that we also disrupted MXAF to ensure that the growth that we're seeing is due to SOXAF. So when we grow a MXAF mutant, so where this cluster is intact, we see growth on methanol plus lanthanide. And if we look at a cell from this culture uh, on the TEM, what we saw is that there had this vesicle, very dense uh, uh, vesicle. And when we did elemental analysis, we find out that it indeed contained lanthanide. So this was very exciting. These further corroborate that lanthanides are being transported into the cytoplasm and not only transported, but stored in the cytoplasm. When we disrupted LOT H, what we saw is that a double mutant MXA of LOT H was unable to grow. So we added succinate to allow growth of the strain and be able to look at it on their uh, uh, via microscopy. And now what you can see is that the cell does not contain these dense dots. The ones that you can see over here, we also did elemental analysis that are considerably smaller and we could not detect any lanthan either. Then we tested what happens when we disrupt the ABC transporter. And what we found was the following. If we disrupt the membrane components, we see that there is no growth of the strain. However, if we disrupt the periplasmic binding protein, we see that there is a slow growth, so inefficient growth, but the strain is able to grow. We also look uh, via using TEM, where is the lanthanide located on these mutants? And what we saw is that there was a dense, dense um, accumulation uh, right at the edge of the cell. So we decided to take a closer look at exactly where was these um, uh, spots located. And what we saw here in these blackest uh, arrows is defining where the outer membrane and the inner membrane are. So we defined that really the accumulation, and then we did also elemental analysis of lanthanide on these mutants occur in the peroplasm. So this is very exciting because what this is showing is that transport to the peroplasm is not enough to allow for efficient growth of our strain. We also look at what happens when we disrupt other uh, periplasmic proteins, in this case, LOT B and LOT G. And what I'm doing here is comparing the growth of LOT A, so the, the ATP component, but also these additional periplasmic proteins. And what you can see is just that as with LOT A, the strain is able to grow, but very poorly. So what this is telling us is two things that the trafficking of lanthanide from the outer membrane to the inner membrane is not just uh, reliant on lot of lot A. It is also reliant on additional periplasmic enzymes. And we don't quite understand the mechanism and how this occurs, but it's something that we are definitely exploring biochemically. We also tested what would happen if we disrupt uh, genes of places where we didn't find hits in our transposome mutagenesis, and that includes LOT C, LOT D, and LAN M. And what we saw is that there is no defect in growth. And that's interesting because LAN M has been characterized by a different group uh, uh, generating LAN moduling that has been shown to bind very efficiently lanthanides. But when we disrupted this gene, we didn't see any phenotype. Another thing that I want to emphasize is that things are not always as simple as they look. Because when we actually let an MXAF LOT H mutant uh, incubate longer, every time we see that around 80 to 100 hours, the strain is able to grow. Now we have corroborated that this effect is not via suppressor. So there's an acclimation event that allowed transport of lanthanides, but it takes a while to, to kick in. So we're obviously very interested in understanding what is this alternative way in how bacteria is able to transport lanthanides inside the cell that is not dependent on the Tom B ABC transport system. So again, we were very, very excited uh, about the observation that the cells are accumulating and storing lanthanides inside the cell. And so we did some elemental analysis to see what was present in this desert spot. And what we saw is that there were lanthanide, uh, lanthanide presence, phosphorus, and oxygen. 
So at this point, what we are hypothesizing is that the accumulation of lanthanide is probably in polyphosphate or phosphate form. Uh, we did also high resolution transmission electron microscopy, and we were able to observe an atomic lattice, a structure that is usually telling us that there may be a crystal or mineral form in these granules. But at this point, this is just an early characterization of these granules, but we're very excited to continue these studies. Of course, there are many remaining questions that we are very excited to tackle. So the first one is, if we have identified a, a, um, a process in how lanthanides are incorporated into the cell that is depending on a Tom B receptor and an ABC transporter, this really suggests that it's a mechanism that is similar to, for example, what it has been found for iron, where chelators, known as siderophores, are facilitating this transport. So where are or who are or what are these lanthanide chelators that we will call lanthanophores now on? Also, once in granule form, how are lanthanide incorporated into SOCCEF and XF? We also want to understand why transport into the periplasm is not enough, right, to facilitate incorporation into periplasmic enzymes. So why do they need to be transported all the way into the cycle? So I want to focus a little bit in our um, task to define uh, the structures or characterize the structures of these lanthanophores. And for that, we set up a collaboration uh, with Lena Daumann at the University of Munich. And she reminded us uh, that arsenazo is a chemical that it can be very convenient for use when we're looking into lanthanides. The reason why is because arsenazo, when it's not coordinated to a lanthanide, is pink, and when it's coordinated to the lanthanide, turns blue. So we use this chemical to optimize measurement of lanthanide content while our cultures were growing. And what I'm showing here is that this is an assay that is fairly linear and sensitive. What I'm showing now is a growth curve where we're taking different ODs as the strain is growing. This is a wild type of strain grown with methanol and lanthanide. And at the same time that we were taking ODs, we were taking samples and then done ICP analysis to be able to identify how much lanthanide was being incorporated into the cell and disappearing from the media. If we use now a very simple uh, colorimetric acid based on arsenazo, we see that we can find a very good correlation. So that was really great because not only facilitate our studies, we don't do ICPMS ourselves, so we have to outsource. So it really facilitates things, but it also gave us a tool to be able to find the lanthanophores. If we consider the opposite thing, if we start with arsenazo already bound to lanthanum, can we, from the supernatant, start separating fractions based on different types of chemistry and see what fractions can compete with arsenazo to chelate lanthanides? And based on this strategy, we have been able to partially purify what we consider a lanthanophores, and we have been characterizing them as well. However, this has proven to be a task more difficult than we have anticipated. And the reason why because now we're learning a lot more, and today I won't be able to go into all the details, is that AM1 produces more than one lanthanophore in order to have an efficient lanthanide transport. And the problem is that these systems, when you disrupt one, the other one jumps in. So it has been harder to prove genetically, and also we are in the process of synthesizing some of these um, structures. But it is an exciting field, and it is a complicated one. So we're excited to continue these studies. So my lab is also interested not only about the metabolic changes that are happening within AM1, but also how would that affect uh, host microbe interactions and microbe microbe interactions. And this is another aspect that uh, we have a project going on. And for that, we're really focusing on the lanthanide effect. So in the 1980s, uh, lanthanides were started to be used as fertilizers for plants. And it was described particularly from China, but also other countries like Bulgaria and Australia, that lanthanides allowed uh, yield increase in many different crops. Different countries in Latin America and Europe also used this approach and they reported the opposite effect. But now what we know is that microbes that belong to the plant microbiome are affected by lanthanides and they definitely modify their metabolism. So we want to understand if this effect is mediated by lanthanide, by methylotrophy. 
So we set up a simple experiment. We uh, inoculated a plant with just lanthanide. We inoculated the plant with just a methylotroph that we know is a member of the plant phylosphere. And then we inoculated bacteria that was grown on lanthanide, the same methylotroph grown on lanthanides. And what we saw is that there was a significant effect on plant growth, really suggesting that methylotrophs are mediating some of the effect uh, of this uh, uh, enhancement in plant growth due to lanthanide. So now what we have done is we went to the field and we isolated uh, many different methylotrophs in the presence of lanthanide from soybean phylosphere. And what I want to show you is how similar phylogenetically they are. So at the level of 16S, it's hard to recognize. However, what has been very uh, exciting is to see that when we test some of these isolates and see what is their metabolic potential, so we test growth in different carbon sources, we see that they are actually fairly different among them, even when at the level of 16S they are not. So these isolates were uh, obtained in the presence of lanthanide. So we decided to see what is the effect when we remove lanthanide from growth. Are these a strict, so are they dependent on lanthanide or is lanthanide just affecting their metabolism? So do they respond to different carbon sources uh, with the presence or absence of lanthanides? And for example, what I'm showing here is the effect of methanol in some of these isolates when we add or when we uh, remove lanthanide from the media. So here we have a relative final yield in the presence of lanthanide, and you can see that there are some differences in yield and also differences in growth rate. So the reason why we're doing this is because we are building a synthetic community, a synthetic community that is going to be of around 100, 96 to 100 isolates. Some that respond to lanthanide, some that are very diverse metabolically, and some that are not. And what we want to do is to assess what happens when we add lanthanide to these cultures? How does the community structure changes? And also, how does those changes correlate with plant growth? And for that, we have set up a collaboration with the Marks Group in Idaho, and they are barcoding our, um, our isolates. So we will be able to monitor the transition uh, of the community structure and also the effect of the plants. On our end, we're going to couple these experiments with metabolomic analysis to see what is changing in the phylosphere and also what is changing in the root exudate. So do the effect above ground affects what is happening below ground and how does that correlate with plant growth? Finally, the last area of a study that we are focusing is to develop lanthanide dependent technologies. And there are two different uh, main applications that we're working on. So lanthanides are not only uh, really strong Lewis acids, some of the chemical properties that lanthanides have is that they are also superconductors, supermagnets, fluorescence, phosphorescences. So these metals are considered critical metals for our technological life, and also for some other medical applications and even national defense. The problem is that these lanthanides are highly insoluble and they are very hard to mine. So right now, the United States is really depending on the production of China for the, uh, the, the supply of rare earths in our nation. And here I'm just showing you some pictures of the mines that are currently in China, where you can see that they, in order to be able to extract them, harsh acid conditions and high temperatures are needed. And again, this is not very efficient. But we now have a microbe that is a specialist in not only sensing, but also chelating and storing lanthanides. So we decided to see if our platform, AM1, is able to grow on different sources of rare earths, complex sources of rare earths. And we try shredded foams, magnet swarf, ores, and even fly ash. And what we were able to see is that our bacteria actually can grow fairly well in all these rare earth sources. So we have the a pipeline that uh, we think is very competitive with this current state of the art. And um, we have now uh, obtained funding from RPAE that is going to allow us to have very clear milestones to develop this technology at even a commercial level. 
So uh, for the next two years, we're gonna try to generate an impact in the te technology that would eliminate the need of harsh acids required for leaching, that would allow selective uh, rare air separation or lanthanide separation, and that would allow these platform to use carbon sources that are fairly inexpensive. So for this project, we are highly interested in recruiting a postdoctoral researcher. Finally, just to finish my talk, uh, we are also very interested in solving other uh, issues, for example, the gadolinium issue. So gadolinium is a main component for contrast agents for MRI. And so there is a lot of concern when patients undergo through these procedures. First of all, how much gadolinium remain on the patient and the toxicity of these. And also the one that is excreted, how do we deal with this biomedical waste? So I mentioned that AM1 is not able to grow on heavy lanthanides. However, we have been able to evolve a strain in order to be able uh, to grow on, on, on heavy lanthanides, including gadolinium. So what I'm showing here in, in white is when we're not adding lanthanides, so we wouldn't see growth. But in pink, what I'm showing is how wild type is not able to grow. The squares, the pink squares, are not able to grow on gadolinium. However, our evolved strain is now able to grow on gadolinium. If we look at ICPOES analysis, we see that indeed, just that we have seen with other metals, other lanthanides, the bacteria AM1 is able to store gadolinium. So this has opened an opportunity for us to be able to use AM1 as a way to, for example, treat for now uh, uh, this uh, medical waste. So we just start with a simple experiment to make competition experiments. What happens when we have these gadolinium contrast agents, just such as uh, DTPA, can M1 uh, sequester gadolinium from this? And what we found is that this is the case. So it is really opening the opportunity to trust other uh, contrast agents and develop this platform in a useful way. So by now, uh, now you have a perspective of what my lab is interested. There are many aspects that we are currently developing. We don't have all the answers yet, but hopefully, as I mentioned, you are as inspired as I am in this amazing opportunity to understand how these new life metals are impacting microbial metabolism and potentially the metabolism of other organisms. And with that, I would like to, help, uh, to really thank the people that have done this work. Uh, all the biochemical work and the gadolinium work was made, uh, was really led by the efforts of Nathan Good and a series of students, undergraduate students, and even a high school student. Carly Suriano, Emily Hawker, Riley Moore, Kamal, and a graduate student, Harvey Lee. All our transport and microscopy experiments were led by the work of Paula Rosenko, and she also had a team of undergraduate students, Madeline Martin and Amanda Goddard. Colleen Friel is the lead uh, person uh, doing all the plant and my uh, microbe interaction analysis. Ali Hurt is a graduate student that also helped with these studies and two undergraduate students, Amanda Goddard and Isabel Velosa. And finally, the biometallurgy project has been uh, really a combination of efforts between Nathan Good, Zach Jensen and myself. And so um, I also want to uh, thank all my collaborators in many different institutions, NSF for their very, very uh, abundant funding. And now we also want to thank RPAE for our future funding. And with that, I'll take questions. That was fantastic. Um, yes, clapping, clapping. Um, <laughs> okay. So, um, <laughs> and so much stuff. Um, why don't you, if, if uh, people can speak out if they want to ask a question, or you can raise your hand, or do the hand raise function in uh, Zoom if you're into that, or you could type a question in the chat. And while that's while those things are coming in, I'm going to ask a question about the transport into the periplasm and the periplasmic enzyme. So, um, so is is SOXF, um, is it exported by like the TAP pathway? Are those PQQ cofactors, do they have to be installed in the cytoplasm and then it's exported as a folded object or? Uh, yeah, so that's a great question. So we don't know, <laughs> we don't know. But okay. we actually think that that ORF6 and ORF7 has to do with that. Oh, okay. Uh, so we are going to try to figure that out. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, I'm going to read a question out from the chat. So, um, is it known how these microorganisms can survive in the presence of lanthanides? So, do they contain enzymes specialized uh, to prevent or avert any harmful chemical reactions that lanthanides may permit? Mm -hmm. So, what we know is that the transport of lanthanide is highly regulated. So, we know that the Tombi transporter is regulated and we know what the regulators are. Uh, so I think that they have ways in which they can control how much lanthanide, how much lanthanide gets stored. Uh, we haven't detected, though, any kind of toxicity related to lanthanide. Like, we can go from nanomolar concentrations, where we see the switch, to millimolar concentrations, and our strains go just fine. So in this case, it's not like when you have iron that is leaching and you know that it's highly redox reactive. We don't really see that type of effect with lanthanides. Saying that though, I'm sure that there are um, toxic mechanisms, but we haven't yet worked with those um, under those conditions because their their transport is highly regulated. Um, any other questions? Because if not, I have another one. <laughs> um, so, uh, all right, another question while I'm waiting for people to type into the chat or raise their hand. Um, would be, uh, so the, the SOXF um, bacteria were first uh, found by people looking at some extreme environments. So are there any other environmental factors aside from the presence or absence of lanthanides that would influence the use of one pathway or another? So is it like the acidic environment or do you know if anything else matters? Yeah, so they have reported four different isolates from this experiment. The one that I talk about was the first one that they reported so V and their assimilation is very different. So I don't think that we can compare the metabolism of sol V with what we knew from uh, our typical methylotropes. It is very different, uh, um, even their assimilation cycle. So mm -hmm. I, I think it is quite different, yeah. And, and this is a methane utilizer I also have to uh, emphasize. Okay. So it starts from methane, but it obviously uses uh, methanol oxidation as well. Okay, so I just got another question. Um, hold on a second. We have several here. All right. Uh, Kareen asks, um, how does the F-LET-E transporter physically bring lanthanide into the cells? Is there a cofactor for uptake across the IM? And is there a change in the structure, presumably, of that cofactor, I think? I oh, know. well, yeah. Oh, these are things that we don't know yet. So we have only identified them, but we have not biochemically characterized them yet. So I don't have the answer to that question. I'm sorry. Um, Jacob West Roberts asks, since AM1 and others are found on the surface of plant leaves, lanthanides must be exported or secreted from plant cells. Has there been any research into how this occurs? Okay, so AM1, so I forgot to, to mention this. AM1 is not found on the surface of the leaves of the plants. PA1 is, is a close relative. Yeah, um, however, uh, you are right. So how is the lanthanide in the surface of the leaves, right? So, but what we do know, and this is just a crazy theory of mine, so I don't have proof for that, but uh, you have a microbiome in the soil, right? And I don't know if part of also, you know, the microbiome that you found on the leaf, it starts from germination, right? And then if we know that the bacteria is storing lanthanides, we can expect that when they die, they may release lanthanides and that's how they can have it there, right? That's one way in which I can think of lanthanides end up there. But Julia Borhol actually measured the amount of lanthanide present in the phylosphere. I can't remember what, and I don't have the number, but it was quite high. So we definitely know that lanthanide is present in, in the phylosphere at high concentrations. Okay. Um, and Max Sosa is curious about the lanthanophores. So can you comment on whether they seem to be small molecules or proteins, or are there any transcriptomic data that might implicate certain gene clusters? Yes, 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 yes. So what we have been finding out, and again, this is a still, we're still validating these results, but we have found different classes, we think, that are different classes of lanthanophores. Some that resemble iron siderophores, but some that are quite unique and different. And again, so what we know is that chemically they can chelate lanthanides, but we're still trying to validate the biological relevance of this. Uh, so we are finding different uh, compounds over the spectrum, I guess. Uh, and some of them we have been able to find the pathway that is making them, and we're currently constructing mutants 
to verify that this is the case. The problem is that as we are now doing transcriptomic with different sources and different forms in how the lanthanide is available, we see that other pathways jump up and down. And we just recently, last week, we found some, um, we got the results of transcriptomic data that is telling us about a completely different system that is transporting lanthanide, but because we don't have a lot of evidence, I couldn't talk about it today. Okay, and I think we have one more question here from Jennifer Lewis. So with regards to the plant growth promotion um, seen with your methylotrophs, do you know whether this is because of an interaction among microbes or a direct effect on the plant? Yeah, so we don't know. The reality is that we don't know. We know that it is mediated by the microbe. Uh, what we don't know if it is because it made a change in maybe another community member and that is what is happening, or is it about maybe an indirect effect? Is it that if we are right and we think that it involves some type of phosphate solubilization as an indirect effect, would that also affect directly the chemistry of the plant? I guess we just don't know yet, but those are the type of questions that we're asking. Is this a direct effect, an indirect effect? It is directly because of lanthanum or maybe another phosphate solubilization is the one that comes to mind because we know that the lanthanophores are also some of them are also allowing phosphate solubilization. Mm. Okay. Okay, well, it is one o'clock and to respect everyone's Zoom time, uh, I wanna say thank you so much to Ceci. That was a wonderful kickoff to the semester. And um, I wanna remind the grad students and postdocs that I sent out a link to a hangout with Ceci that will start at 1.30 and go to 2.30. Um, some of you have already indicated that you're going to be there. That's great, but I just want to give the opportunity to, to all the people in the department who might want to talk to her since we, we can't have lunches right now. So um, uh, thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing you guys for next week's seminar, which will be from the plant side, and I'm afraid I don't know who that is. But thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Ceci. Bye. Bye. Okay.